I really roll my eyes when people say, well, everything's been invented. It's like, what world are you living in? Do you want a lifestyle company or do you want to be the next Google? And you notice it has very little to do with the entrepreneur skill set um, or talent or appearance or race or age or gender. It's really a mindset. Welcome to Squaring the Circle. This is part four of our entrepreneurial tech trailblazing series featuring the insightful Bob Butler. Today, we share valuable tips to help your business message stand out amidst the noise. Moreover, what is the difference between a truly ambitious entrepreneur and someone who's just tired of corporate employment? Let's find out where the difference lies. It might be imperative to your survival as an entrepreneur. When you're trying to decide whether this idea you have is good enough for you to take the risk, one of the things you should look at is it driven by some fundamental change. And that's what I always tell people. That's where you start. Is something changed? And then the next thing you ask yourself is, do I have some special talent in this area? Do I, do I have something somebody else doesn't have that positions me to, to build something that responds to this change? And then the third thing is, do you, do you have a differentiator? I mean, is there something you can do that will differentiate yourself? And then the last thing is, do I have a compelling message? You know, can I get people's attention? Um, because you haven't, you lived until you built a restaurant and nobody came to eat at it, or you built software that was brilliant, but nobody bought it. When you haven't had that experience, which I would encourage people to avoid, um, you miss a really important lesson. And that really important lesson is your story isn't really good if nobody hears it. You know, if you're the tree that falls in the forest. One of the big epic things that's changing is marketing. And so as you look at your opportunity, you know, get your online customer, make sure there's a, a shift, make sure you have a differentiator, make sure you have some kind of extra advantage. But at the end of the day, do you have a story that people are going to want to listen to? And do you have a way to get that out? And, and here's what's changed. Uh, and I have to explain it kind of in metaphors, in, in, in kind of picture two scenes. The way all marketing has existed historically is kind of like the classroom lecture metaphor. You as the seller would get to the podium and you would pay or earn through your gravitas and your academic credential, but you, you would pay for the position of the podium. And then you would work hard and pay to create this presentation that was slick, but mainly it was effective at communicating. And then you would pay to have an audience there who was interested. Somehow there was a, an economic process that's you know, through tuition or part of an institution or part of a promotion who selected who would sit in that audience who would be predisposed to your message. And even though we think of that in terms of education, all marketing is really kind of the same thing. You target customers, you create a presentation, you have a message, you, you establish your gravitas and credibility to present that message, and all of that costs money. And that's what marketing has always historically been. That model is broken. That doesn't exist anymore. And this is one of these really fundamental shifts that's creating huge opportunities for new generation that just understands that. The ad agencies, the, you know, the Facebook advertising, all these things that use that model. I won't say they don't work, but their price efficiency is getting pretty darn low. Um, so, so what's the new model? You know, what's the new metaphor? What's happening? How do you market if you've got your message? And what I tell people is, well, here's a different scene. Instead of the, you know, the, the stadium seating in the in front of the podium at the at the auditorium. Uh, picture yourself a nice room with no windows, no furniture, and the room is filled with people standing shoulder to shoulder, and they're all talking at the top of their lungs. Right? They're, they're telling some story as loud as they possibly can, all at the same time. And you walk into that room and say, okay, I have a really good message. Well, <laughs> it doesn't matter. 
because you know you're just another noise in the noise and so you spend all this time all this money trying to get in the room and trying to have a great message that nobody hears you what that means is all the money spent on trying to go viral and, and trying to have a thing that suddenly a million people want to read. You know, and, and some people do that. I mean, you, some people do break through and, and somehow everybody stops in the room and pays attention to them and listen. It does happen. But people win the lottery, too. If you want to get rich by playing the lottery, you'll, you'll be some percentage of rich people. But it's not a very big percentage. The better bet is to figure out how to get your message out in that room. And that's just the way I describe it is you lean over and whisper in somebody's ear right next to you and you say something interesting enough in the first two seconds of talking that they stop talking and turn and have a conversation with you. And then they get interested and they whisper to somebody next to them and it just kind of goes around the room. If you're a marketing plan, you can resist the siren songs of raising a lot of money and throwing it at a lot of um, traditional old models, you're, you're just going to have a lot better luck. Because the, the truth of the matter is nobody can afford the current marketing model unless they're already a big force in the market. What, what's happened with nobody realizing when, when the internet, and Google search engine and all that stuff happened, it was a panacea. We could all get our word out cheap. I marketed Time Matters for years just by saying good things about myself on forums. Didn't even have marketing. Took a couple of ads in American Bar Association magazine and I was done. The world is even different of even two or three, four or five years ago now. The gatekeepers who control access to those sources, they're just way too expensive. Um, and you really have to develop something about your product, something about your approach, something about your differentiation something about your message that somebody who is already busy talking about what they care about goes, oh, well, that's interesting. I want to know more. And if you keep that metaphor in your mind as you start to try to get the word out about your new venture, I think you, you're going to do a lot better because what most people are ending up doing is their ventures are just becoming tenants of the marketing system. You know, all their money is going into marketing, trying to raise their sales. Um, so that they can raise more money. You get caught in this vicious cycle where you you really think you're running your own company, but you're just trading dollars with the gatekeepers for the access to the customer. It's not sexy and it's not exciting and it's not new and people aren't going to ask you to uh, make YouTube videos about your marketing strategy. But I see companies every day using these techniques and they just get bigger and bigger every month. They're not getting any social media time. Now they're on social media. You know, you, there's a certain amount of stuff you do. It's always the chance uh, you could be discovered, but you can't over invest in that because you just, you can't afford it. I'd love to own a chip manufacturing company or a car company, but I just don't, I can't start at a billion dollars uh, to build my plant. You know, the numbers are decimal points smaller, but it's the same problem. The entry point for marketing a startup today is 10x higher than it was four years ago. And you really have to have a good plan for that. So we are in probably facing the times of gold rush in AI. And the fam famous proverb says, you know, if you are living during the gold rush, you're right. best by selling the shovels, right? Well, I love that, that metaphor. I really appreciate you loving that one up for me because I've always had a version of that. And the story I like to tell is, you know, there were two merchants in the gold rush town and one of them, you know, shovels were $2 before the gold was discovered. And then when all the miners showed up, one merchant sold all the shovels for $50 and sold out all the shovels. The other merchant, um, held back the shovels for the farmers and the, the non-gold rush people and kept selling them for $2. Again, a pricing strategy. And after the gold ran out, the $50 shovel merchant was gone. And the $2 merchant who had a long-term, sustainable, scalable pricing model survived for generations. So I think AI has to be approached the same way anything else does. It's new, 
it's interesting. It's got potential. It's generating lots of opportunity. It's really not a very good project yet. I mean, it, it's really not delivering quality results. As I was looking for opportunities in AI, I would be very careful of getting into this mentality of build it, they will come. And some people can play that game. If you have enough capital, there, you know, you mentioned I was a commercial pilot. There's a, a story about aviation. Vietnam War, we had these very light, um, fast, good dogfighting jets made out of very thin tin, mm. and you blew up anything near them, you, they'd fall out of the sky. So we decided to build air tanks called the F-4, which was basically you could hit it with a missile and it would bounce off. And what the F-4 taught us was that given enough horsepower, you could get a brick to fly. You know, with enough money, you can get any idea to look successful. Most of the people watching this aren't going to be a member of that club. You, you know, you just can't access that game. Play the hand you're dealt, operate in the theater you have experience, use the networks you have, and chances are you'll read about all the people being successful with that model, but you're, you're just not eligible. You're just not going to be able to access the capital. And what happens is the lines get blurred. You, you think, well, I can raise you know, $10 million and buy all this advertising, advancing the truth a little bit, fake it till I make it, I can, I can do all that. But you really can't. I mean, there's very few people they certainly exist and they can be admired and, and they can be successful, but you have to realize it's not very likely you can play the game that way. If I was looking at AI, as I do, because I look at everything, I would be looking for opportunities to really put it to use somewhere where there's a problem where a customer says, I'm doing this, it's kluge, it's inefficient, I'm not getting good results. Do you have a solution? I see a lot of stuff like that. It's a, for my eye, there's just a lot of stuff in the yeah. world that doesn't work well. I really roll my eyes when people say, well, everything's been invented. It's like, what world are you living in? All day, I sit in front of my computer and say, well, that works really poorly. And I think there's real opportunity for specific, very focused problem solving using OpenAI's API and things like that. But everybody's looking for the big game-changing, high-profile venture, and, and that's fine because they, they might pull it off, and I wish them the best. But you, in life, you've got to play the probabilities. Um, and the probabilities are you don't have access to all the pieces of that puzzle, even though there's plenty of people making you think you can if you buy their book or sign up for their website or their YouTube. The reality is um, there's opportunity for everyone but it's really very important you you use your model, the model that's appropriate for where you are. And you'd be amazed how quickly you can make a lot of money. I mean, everybody talks about billionaires, but I live in a world where there's a lot of people with 100 to $500 million net worth. You never hear about them. You, 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 you have no idea, you know, they're doing all these obscure business things that are essential to everyday life that we never hear about, but they got $500 million in the bank. And, you know, those are my heroes. I mean, those, and there's a lot of them out there and they're being minted every day. Mm. And they all had something they cared about that they stayed in their lane. They used basic, create value for customer kind of thinking. And all of a sudden in 10 years, they're very successful and you've never heard of, you know, and you never will. And, and somehow in our culture, they're making, you know, just stuff that runs our world. And there's so many of them. There's so much wealth. There's so much happening. I mean, this is absolutely the golden age. But for whatever reason, a different picture is being painted. And it's all about this image of one person with this one great idea who changes the world. But the reality is there's a small team. Usually, usually there's two or three partners, another core of five, six, seven, eight, real core inside people. They're just kind of fixing one thing, solving one problem that makes everything work better. And there's just so much of that happening. And they're happy and mm -hmm. they're doing good work. And 
and I've never, you know, in the 50 years I've been in business, I've never seen this much, what I would call real opportunity. While everyone else is worrying about, you know, which billionaire is doing something crazy today, this other whole layer of people uh, following the kind of plans that I've talked about are, are just doing great. All right, let's go to Final Surge. Final Surge was a, a classic lesson of my nemesis, of what goes wrong in my life. So I love helping companies and I love building my own, but at some point you get a little older and you, you kind of want to have all the fun, but not work so hard. So then instead of starting, because all entrepreneurship, all entrepreneurship is a lot of work. At some point in your life, you stop doing it for yourself and you start doing it for some other entrepreneurs. And everyone comes to that point and I did too. So I started helping other entrepreneurs first with, um, I, I called it an accelerator. At the time, they were all called incubators. I, I think I was the first one to use an accelerator, but they're, they're all accelerators now. It was a different model, and uh, the model was not chase VC, but get revenue from your launch customers so you can skip VC because of the flaws in VC I mentioned earlier, and get to debt, you know, non-dilutive, non-equity-based debt to grow. And so that was the concept of the um, TechStars Plus incubator. And so I spent five years and, and, and I, it was really wonderful because I went to Hutchinson and Warwick Robbins, which are the two top entrepreneur support law firms, and said, what are the best entrepreneurs you got? You know, I, I didn't just open my doors to everyone. Um, so each one, I presented the model. They introduced me some entrepreneurs. From that, we picked a small select group. And so this wonderful experience I had of really, you know, trying to help these these entrepreneurs. Uh, and it taught me as, as much as it, it, it taught them. And many of the lessons, you know, I've talked about here today, you know, were from that, that experience. When you're trying to start up a company as an advisor. So, you know, I had all this experience as well. I've been advising them in my little you know, controlled environment, I should be able to be just as good going out advising them and being on the board. And one of the things I've learned is this idea of what's motivating them. You really have to try to understand why somebody's being an entrepreneur. There's two real danger zones. One is they really just don't want a boss. <laughs> and and again, some of those have been successful, but they are not well represented in the population of successful entrepreneurs I know. And the other one is they really just kind of want a lifestyle company that once they kind of make some money and they're in control and they don't have a boss, they're satisfied. And this is the real challenge if you're out trying to help entrepreneurs. And so when I sit, when I get connected with one and we talk about working together, the first question is, do you want a lifestyle company or do you want to be the next Google? You want to be the next unicorn, 10 years, billion dollar company. Choose now or forever hold your peace. This is binary and it affects everything we do from every moment on. And of course, what I've learned is 100% of the answers is, oh, we want to be the next unicorn. So I set up everything to make that happen. And along the way, usually a year or two in, start making some money and, and it really starts to look like it's going to go somewhere. And that's the moment of truth. And all too often, the entrepreneurs say, well, you know, I was losing $5,000 a month, and now I'm making $20,000 a month. And I, I was able to buy the pool. It's always a pool for some reason. They decide that being a lifestyle company is enough. And that, that happens to me quite a bit. And of course, and that's why you see in my resume, kind of two years as chief operating officer, and move on because I'll just tell you what happens. We start really getting some success and they decide that's good enough and they do great. They're great people. And this is by no means criticism. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a lifestyle company, nothing wrong with work-life balance. No matter how I tell these stories, it always kind of like I'm kind of being critical, but I'm really not. I, it's really okay to want a lifestyle company. The only thing that's not okay is to not tell me that. <laughs> um, it's just a totally different 
situation. Everything you do is different because it's all about scalability. It's all about sustainability. And you have to do a lot of things that aren't problems yes. yet. You know, they're, they're going to be a problem in yeah. two years. You know, what do you mean I got to spend money on a lawyer because, you know, we might have a, a public offering someday? What do you mean planning for due diligence that's six years out? Uh, there's just a lot of things that happen. So great company, great people, couldn't be happier with the work we did there. I mean, this is a case where Tisby just absolutely blew everyone away. They had an app that was not the standards by any stretch of the imagination. They had gotten quotes in like a quarter million dollars to upgrade the app. I swooped in like a hero with Tisby. And in six months, we did an app that is still the, the market leader. It's been rated the top app in their market ever since for one tenth the cost and one third the schedule. And part of it was my experience at building these apps because it was it was an athletic training app and I'm a triathlete and an Ironman certified coach and a tech guy. So I uniquely understood what the app would have to do, which circles back to my point is the key is knowing what the customer wants. And so with that knowledge and Tisby's ability to put a team together and really connect with the project, we just did some great work there and, and they, they've done well and they yeah, should do I, well. I can mirror the compliment because not every Tisby customer knows exactly how to do things, how, how, to, how yeah. to materialize that vision into the app. And it's amazingly good to have an expert on the subject and as well with the same person, an expert in how to build and how to promote and how to yeah. bring it to the market. So I, I think it's just a rare combination for success, which has to happen. It doesn't have to be one person, but you have to have these resources to, to bring the project to the market. Yeah, and in my case, it's a lifelong experience, but you really don't need that. Where you get that from is the launch customer. The, the launch customer can take my place. Do not have to have a Bob Butler in the scene to be a successful author. Happy to sit on your board, you know, happy to advise. But the point is, I don't want to leave the impression you got to have some, some guy like me to be successful advising. That's what the launch customer will do for you. But you do have to have somebody like Tisby who can interface with that person, who can really execute. Yeah, it's you have to trust your technical team or you're doomed. Yeah. That's another thing. Well, there's the, the difference I'll just observe for others who don't, you know, want specific. There are real differences in how you do business. You know, we've already mentioned the way that you eliminate all the technology risk. The second thing you do is your project managers are part of the client's team. I mean, I work with your project managers as if they work for me. I mean, they literally, old phrase we used to use is they come in house. A lot of people talk about doing that, but yeah. they don't really do it. And, and your culture is, if you're a Tisby project manager working for XYZ company, nobody at XYZ is going to notice that that person works for Tisby. That's just kind of your style. And that, that that's that's pretty huge. And, and the other big differentiator I see is, you, you know, your product vision. You, you, you're driven by the end game. What are we trying to create here? Um, most of the hired consultants in engineering are just kind of working against the statement of work. You know, they're like scribes. I'll build what you want me to build. I don't know what it does. I don't care what it does. But the scope of work says this. You know, the Figma prototype shows this. We'll build that for you. The, there's a cultural difference. And other companies do this, uh, but but you do it always and forever. You you really are saying, what are we trying to build here? And and you'll kind of put your hand up and say, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, you you're, you get emotionally invested in the goal because you take the longest view of any consultant I ever did. I mean, your typical relationship with a customer is measured in mm -hmm. years. You know, there, there's never this six month project. Most consultants are project based. You're success based. When I brought you stuff, I've seen you kind of go, oh, I'm not too interested in that, Bob. I'm sorry. Love working with you. But... And I tried to figure out what 
doesn't turn you on. And I realize what doesn't turn you on is these these kind of project based, just kind of one and done kind of thing. You love to come on board and just be there for the future that you're all going to enjoy. And that's a cultural thing. That's a leadership thing. But I can't stress enough how rare that is. It didn't used to be rare. It didn't used to be rare at all. In fact, when I first started working with you, you didn't really seem that exceptional. But now it's I don't see it anywhere. And and every time I start to help a company, they've got some consultant they're working with. And so I've had a lot of exposure to what's out there. Um, and for whatever reason, which I really don't understand, everything is project, budget, statement of work. You know, you're just another, another customer. Culture, like your subscription models, which you described before, unfortunately, the, right now the technology marketplace is extremely cluttered and there is amazing amount of bad providers among the good providers. Yeah. And maybe we are not that exceptional, but what we do well is we, we work with the love, right? We always define uh, all of our projects are passion. Uh, we are passionate for our client success. We are passionate about technology and keeping the client's relationship for years. And that that's our kind of model. Yeah, I really, I'm really smiling because I just, I'm kind of remembering back when I brought you projects you really weren't yeah. interested in. <laughs> you know, you, you, your economics and business people really hate to say no, but you have this wonderful way of saying, oh, no, <laughs> that's not interesting to us. Well, you know, I, I think you're like anybody else that uh, certainly I've become like this. You know, you want success, you want money, you, you want adulation but you don't want it to come with a lot of problems. You know, you, you want to be able to enjoy your success and work-life balance isn't just about getting away to your lake house or beach house or, or getting to the multi-coast. Work-life balance is while you're working, it's not a lot of stress or problems. Um, and, um, you know, doing what you're good at is a, is a way, is a real key way to avoid stress or problems. And you guys tend to be, have the discipline to, do what you're good at. I don't. I don't think you are cavalier in picking who you know only your what you want to work with. But I do think you're pretty careful about not taking things that aren't in your wheelhouse. And and one of the other things I want to take this opportunity to mention that kind of is a segue, but it's also part of all this getting the product right. When I've talked a lot about launch customer. <laughs> There's one other little wrinkle after you get the launch customer, and that is know your customer. And I had this really amazing experience. I mean, I love being at LexisNexis. You know, I mean, we, we it was a great company, and some M and A guys there didn't like me very much, but you know, there was a lot of people I connected to, and they were in a buying spree. They were buying all these little software companies, and they wanted to put them all together in this one unified legal platform and you know they they wanted me to stay and they they treated me like they wanted me to stay and that's quite a transition to go from an entrepreneur with 50 engineers to one with 5000 and but they spent a lot of money to bring in the world's best onboarding executive a guy named George Bratt great guy and really helped me transition from entrepreneur to C suite executive and armed with George Bratt they had the confidence to give me a very big job. Uh, first off, I got promoted to chief operating officer of practice management, which nobody gets acquired and then promoted. You, you spend your two years and you know, you're know you gone. But um, with George's help, I was doing pretty well in transitioning. And so I had this job of all these companies they bought all did different parts of the legal mm -hmm. platform. One did document automation, one did document management, one did billing, one did accounting. And they wanted to pull all these different companies together. So we all met in Toronto, all the former Bob Butlers of all these companies, now all employees, now with this incredibly ambitious project. It was called Project Boombox. Never forget. Not my name. So I was in charge of Project Boombox. And, and, and large, complicated projects. They're my catnip. I mean, I've always been really drawn to that kind of stuff. So I was had the dream job. 
And we're all sitting around this huge conference room, all the smartest people in the world in their disciplines. They all invented their own little segment of the market. And everyone was arguing about what the product should look like. Again, this was the, the primary exercise. What are we building? Because I knew by then the importance before we write our first line of code to integrate all our products, what does the product look like? I, I, I was just shocked at how much argument was going on. And I, I, you know, I'm in the leadership position and I'm trying to figure out well, how do I calm this down? <laughs> you know, this, this is starting to look like world wrestling or something here. And it just hit me like lightning. It wasn't that everybody disagreed. It's that everybody in the room was right. And they were right based on their view of the customer, the context of the customer they had in mind, the feature that they were championing was right. The problem was they all had different customers in mind. So the ones who thought customers were power users and smart and wanting to learn and you know do a good job, they had one view of the type of features we could have. And the other who had views that customers were lazy and, and you know not capable and thought the CD tray was a cup holder in their computer um, had a totally different view. And of course there are customers like, like both of them visualized. So they were both right, but they were very, very different. And it turned out the breakthrough was really not talking about what the product will be, but talking about who really is our customer and what really is their characteristics. And then armed with the knowledge that, you know, um, a very famous book, Jeff Moore's Crossing the Chasm gave us, which I still recommend as reading to all entrepreneurs. It's not only about what is the profile of the different customers, but when are they going to arrive? You know, that's, you've heard the phrase early adopters, laggers. Those are all Jeff Moore's concepts. And so if you get this idea of getting your team on the same page of the customer distribution and characteristics, and when they are going to arrive for your customer, if you get and you do that in the context of a launch customer where you can apply in real time what you're doing, you have done the most valuable thing to set your entrepreneurial effort on the road to success. And of course, it's great when LexisNexis, they were all on my team and sitting there you know, in their offices, ready to do my billing, but very few entrepreneurs have that opportunity. And that's where having the right kind of relationship with the right kind of contracting company is just so critical um, to the success. And when somebody starts looking at how they're going to get their dream built, it comes back to the idea, you're going to really depend on that contractor and they're going to have the ability to pull the plug on you by either not doing a good job or getting too expensive. And so you got to see that they have a culture of having skin in the game about caring about your That's outcome. Great... And, and the, these are the things that entrepreneurs just have to know. And you notice it has very little to do with the entrepreneur's yeah. skill set or talent or appearance or race or age or gender. It's really a mindset. So some stuff you can't create, like the desire to solve a problem. You know, some of that's you got to have. But almost all the rest, somebody's just got to explain it to you because everybody can do this stuff. Thank you for watching part four. We hope you've gained some valuable knowledge and we encourage you to join us for our fifth and final part of this series. Make sure you're caught up on the previous parts of this entrepreneurial tech trailblazing series. As always, thanks for listening and we look forward to having you join us in part five.